Our next speaker is well known for his advocacy work for zero waste on global level, and he is a knowledgeable authority on negative impacts from waste incineration, and he has been researching waste management for over 30 years. He saw both incineration problems as well as implemented zero waste solutions on different continent, continents and in different circumstances. He summarized those experiences in 10 steps towards zero waste. Welcome to Slovenia again, Dr. Paul Konat. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and the Minister, all the activists here. So, I'm glad that you have a coffee break after this. That was a sensible decision. Uh, a stepping stone to sustainability. This is more than just waste we are talking about here. My involvement, uh, well, the, the talk, uh, personal introduction, followed by uh, sustainability, a few words, and finally, the 10 steps to, to zero waste. My own involvement, I first got involved in 1985 over a local incinerator battle. Um, and over the last 30 years, the issue has taken me to 49 states in the USA and 63 other countries. Between 85 and 95, as Director of Work on Waste USA, I, we help citizens to stop 300 incinerators from being built in the United States. And they've only built one incinerator in the United States since 1997. So what do the American people know that Mr. Renzi uh, and the Mayor of Florence does not know? Uh, I first heard about zero waste uh, when I was asked to do a videotape of a conference in uh, California in 1998, and the result was this videotape, Zero Waste, an Idealistic Dream or a Realistic Goal. Obviously, I concluded the latter and have been working ever since to promote uh, zero waste. And particularly in Italy, uh, which I've now visited 70 times, and I've spoken in 269 different Italian cities. I love Italy. And I love this man, Rossano Ercolini, who uh, we have been working with since 1996 on this. And with uh, Patricia Lasciotto from Trapani, the three of us wrote this book, uh, Re Re Refuti Zero, A Revolution in Progress. And in 2013, this was translated into English, much expanded with many more pictures and illustrations of best studies. And although the publisher insisted upon my single name on the book, it was a, a team effort. And I had a thrill a couple of weeks ago in Italy to meet Pope Francis and actually give him a copy of the Zero Waste book. And so hopefully we'll get some support from higher up in our efforts. Um, the full title of the book is The Zero Waste Solution, Untrashing the Planet One Community at a Time. As Rosanna has said, this is a bottom-up movement. We need good local leadership, political leadership, as you have here in Ljubljana. The foreword to this book was written by Jeremy Irons, who hosted this movie, Trashed. How many people have seen that movie, Trashed? Oh, this is good. This is very good. Okay. Um, a few words about sustainability. We would need five planets if everybody consumed like an American. We would need two planets if everybody consumed like a European. And meanwhile, India and China are copying our consumption patterns. Uh, China wants to build 300 incinerators, massive incinerators, 3,000 ton a day incinerators. We have to set a better example. And the best place to start this better example is with waste. Um, we have to move from a throwaway society to a sustainable society. That's the overall goal. And the last gasp of 
The throwaway society is the incinerator. You build the high, the, the cathedral of consumption at one end of town and the high tech toilet at the other with a diminishing time between the, the materials you buy one day and then the destruction of those materials at the other end of, of town. Uh, in more familiar language, we need to move from a linear economy to a circular economy. And the, the linear economy is extraction, uh, c uh, production, consumption, waste. We use an enormous amount of energy extracting materials and transporting materials and manufacturing uh, products and more transport. Uh, to do this, looking at the global impacts, we're ripping down rainforests, we're extinguishing species, uh, we're producing solid waste, 70 times more solid waste in those first two steps than we see over here at the, at the end. We produce air pollution there, we produce water pollution there, we produce pollution of the oceans, uh, the devastating images that are coming from the Pacific, they were captured in the movie Trash. This is an albatross. The albatross flies thousands of miles around the Pacific gathering food to feed its young on the Leeward Islands. But they're not feeding their young food anymore. They're feeding them plastic, plastic bottle caps. It's really heartbreaking to see this. We put 9 million tons of plastic into the seas every year. We need to read, we are reducing the availability of clean water. Um, we're exhausting fossil fuels and mineral resources. We're producing carbon dioxide with all that energy use, and that of course is contributing to global warmings. So this is business as usual. What we're doing to the planet with this linear system. So how do the different ways of handling waste impact this picture? Well, landfilling. If you bury your waste, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. So there's no change. It's business as usual. It's, it's not sustainable. Landfilling is not a sustainable solution. What if we burn the waste? If we burn the waste, again, we have to go back to square one. And worse, we also produce carbon dioxide and a lot of nasty pollution as well, and we're left with a, a toxic ash. Um, so neither incineration or its variants, gasification, is a sustainable solution. Now, they like to sell incinerators on the basis of waste to energy. In actual fact, they're a huge waste of energy because this energy that you've used in extraction and transport and production, that cannot be recovered with incineration. That is lost to you. And also, it's a huge wasted opportunity to fight global warming. All this energy use is producing carbon dioxide, global warming. So when we, we go back to square one, we haven't done anything to fight this global warming. However, if we recycle materials, we cut out all the impacts of extraction. Important. And if we reuse the whole object, we cut out both the impacts of extraction and manufacture. And similarly with composting, we, we reduce the use of synthetic fertilizers, but we also produce compost which improves the structure of the soil, holds onto water, and holds onto nutrients, and holds onto carbon. If you look at that compost there, you see bits of wood. That is carbon. In an incinerator, that's immediately converted to CO2. But in uh, uh, the land, in the soil, that can be held onto for several months. And they've had some extraordinary uh, experimental results from California, which suggests that the simplest, quickest, and cheapest way to fight global warming is composting. Composting the massive quantities of organic waste we produce in our cities. They've applied about a centimeter of compost to grazing land. And after a few years, they found a massive uptake of carbon into the roots of the plants. The compost opens the structure of the soil, the plants go deeper, and the result is lots and lots of carbon is being sequestered underground. Very, very simple. So this is a real grassroots solution to fighting climate change. 
So as far as sustainability is concerned, every ton that we bury or burn takes us in the opposite direction that we should be going. Whereas every ton that we uh, compost, every ton that we reuse, every ton that we recycle, and every ton that we avoid takes us in the right direction towards sustainability. Uh, the waste problem is not going to be solved by magic machines, but with better organization, better education, and better industrial design. And so now I should talk about the practicalities. This is a vision. Yes, it's a vision, but we can approach this vision in concrete, simple, and uh, simple, practical steps. And the first step, of course, is source separation. These 10 things make waste. They make waste by mixing everything together. If you separate, then, of course, you're dealing with resources. The second critical step is door-to-door -door collection. Enzo Favorino is here, and, and he can tell you exactly how Porta a Porta collection began in Italy. It began with farmers wanting more organic material in their soil. How could they get it? And he said, you can get it from the domestic waste stream, but you must get it clean. And the only way you can get it clean is Porta a Porta. That was the beginning of Porta a Porta collection in, um, in Italy. In San Francisco, it looks like this. Three containers picked up once a week, one for the recyclables, one for the compostables, and one for the residuals. In Italy, very elegant systems. Same trucks picking up different materials on different days. Very simple, save money, and uh, are very accepted by the, the public. In Spain, they've copied this system. They call it the Italian method. But uh, here in Anani, in Basque country, they're particularly good at it. And they've added a Spanish twist to this, very interesting twist. They have hooks, hooks on the wall. And on those hooks, you hang your containers for the different uh, materials. And if you don't have a wall, you can put them on posts. Well, each of those containers has a number, and each hook has a number. Each household has a number, and only that hook is for, for them. Um, in Prestine, Wales, they have a low-tech curbside separation system. They have a little truck, which was once a milk uh, van, electric milk van, and they do the separation at curb. The people come out to the man of the truck, and he separates into the different uh, compartments. And they have a special enforcement system in Prestine, Wales, a special enforcement system. It's the town crier. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Somebody in Smith Street is not separating their trash. Very embarrassing. Very embarrassing and a very effective enforcement system. In Castelbono in Sicily, tall, uh, very narrow streets, very steep straight streets, and they have a special collection system that they've developed. Very, very high tech. It's the Ragusa donkey. And that donkey is, goes door to door to collect the recyclables and the compostables. And the Cittadini, the citizens love these donkeys. And this man that looks after the donkey, he's a recovering alcoholic. He missed many days of work. But since he's had the donkey and he meets the tourists and he meets the citizens, he's a very happy man. And he hasn't missed a day of work since. So this underlines a very important story with zero waste. It's not just about recovering materials. It's about recovering people. People need jobs and people need respect. In Brazil, uh, once upon a time, there were a million people picking resources off the landfill. Men, women, and children in bare feet picking out resources from the landfill, making money but a dangerous job. Now they've, they've organized into cooperatives, the Catadores, and they've got governments, they're negotiating with the government, they've negotiated the right to go door to door and collect these same materials door to door in a much safer, safer way with these elegant little electric carts. And that's also happening in Colombia and in Argentina and in India. Uh, the, the rag pickers, the waste pickers are winning respect and uh, um, and a role to play. Step three, uh, uh, composting. Composting 
more important than recycling. In, in America, we've made the mistake of the blue box program where you put all the emphasis on getting recyclables, but leave the organics in the residuals where you can't use it, for, at least for agriculture. So composting, to use compost in agriculture, you must get it clean. That's why you need this door-to-door -door collection. Here you see the organics from Anani in Spain, an amazing uh, purity. They're getting, the Cittadini are getting 99.76% purity of their organics with this door-to-door -door collection system. Very good. And in San Francisco, they know that a large amount of the good organic waste is going to come from restaurants and hotels. So they've made it 25% cheaper to uh, put out uh, containers for the separated organics instead of mixed waste. So an economic incentive. And the municipality also sends people to teach the kitchen workers to make sure they put exactly the right materials in that green container for the organics. The organics go to this composting facility outside San Francisco. It's surrounded by farmland, and the farmers are using the compost to grow fruit and vegetables, which go back to San Francisco. And the compost is also being used in 200 uh, vineyards. Step four, uh, recycling. In San Francisco, this is their large recycling facility on Pier 96, and it's a large facility. You see the, the picking lines here. Now, this company, the company that owns, has the collection rights, also owns the composting and also owns the recycling, but it doesn't own the landfill. And so it has no incentive to send waste to the landfill, but every incentive to send separated materials to the recycling and composting operations. The other piece of good news is that this company is a worker-owned company. These workers are, own this company, so they're making profit from doing it the right way in San Francisco. And here in Brazil, you see the Cadadores now bringing the material to warehouses, and the same thing is taking place. The material is, is separated, uh, upgraded, made ready for market, and then, of course, it's sent to market. So these people are making money now at every stage of this operation, the Cadadores. Step five, reuse and repair centers, which I hope will become community centers, especially in the big cities. It's a way of recreating the village in the anonymous city. These are places that people like to go to because they can get a bargain. In Berkeley, California, you've got urban ore. And the thing about reusables compared to recyclables is reusables are low volume but high value. Low volume, high value. So in Los Angeles, the reusable fraction is only 2%, but it's worth well over a third of the total value of all the discarded materials. So with reuse and repair, you know you can make money. You know you can create jobs and small businesses. And so a tremendous investment for any city is to make available to the activista, the activist, facilities where they can do this. Because once they've got going, it will be self-sustaining. Uh, Urban Ore has been running for over 30 years, grossing $3 million a year, and 37, actually 37, not 27, 37 well-paid jobs. Now, this is the kind of anything. It's a, it's a shopping mall, a shopping mall for second-hand goods, particularly building materials. Building materials are very valuable. And a door, <laughs> porter, a porter, a porter, a porter, a porter. Uh, if you want a toilet bowl, go to San Francisco. Um, now, over on the other side of the country, in Vermont, same idea, but a, a beautifully laid out operation. Uh, a very attractive um, working televisions, working machines, uh, furniture, beautifully laid out. But in addition, this operation, resource, is training people, unemployed people off the streets to handle large, repair large machines, small machines, uh, electrical goods, electronic goods. And after nine months, they give them a certificate and help them to get a job. Recovering people. And in addition, they're linked to Deconstruction, a company that takes down old buildings carefully from the 
opposite direction they went up, recovering the materials, some of which are used for uh, new buildings, but other materials are used to make uh, products, beautiful furniture like this, value added. So reuse and repair centers can be used for, oh, I've got some examples on videotape. I urge you to go to AmericanHealthStudies.org, my website, and have a look at some of the, the videotapes there. So we can use reuse and repair centers for poverty relief, job creation, job training, uh, linked to deconstruction, linked to other value-added enterprises, community development, community education. Because people enjoy going there, this is the place that you can teach them all kinds of other things. How to compost in your backyard, how to, how to uh, can food, store food, etc., etc., etc. And, and to fight over consumption, we need to recreate those villages. And we can have fun. I mean, it, landfills are boring. Incinerators are boring, boring, uncreative. The Rambo approach to waste management. No, no, no. We have to make it fun. Because if we don't make it fun, people won't want to be part of this. If we make it fun, they'll want to be part of it. In Sweden, in Gothenburg, they have a wonderful reuse park. Wonderful. When you go there... There's a band playing to welcome you. That's a good start. When you go around, there are clowns to entertain the, the children. And when you go to the toilet, it's an art gallery. You can sit there choosing which painting you're going to buy after you've finished your important business. And my favorite, my favorite is this dog. This dog can separate multi-materiali, multi-mixed recyclables into six different categories. Now I ask you, if a dog in Sweden can separate into six different categories, surely Mr. Renzi and Florence could separate into, into three. Um, so the next steps are all attempting to reduce the, the residual fraction. Uh, step six, economic incentives. The simplest one is the pay-by-bag system, the pay-as-you-throw system. Very simple. The compostables, free. The recyclables, free. But the residual fraction, the more you make, the more you pay. And it's been very successful in Italy. It's, uh, in some communities, they've gone from 70% separation to 85% with this one simple addition. And in Capanari, they have a very, very simple system. The reusable bag that's for the residual fraction has a chip in it. The citizens only pay when they put that bag out. They can put it out once a week, but if they don't put it out for a month, they're not paying for that amount of money. So uh, it's a, w a simple way for citizens to save money, but to do the right thing. Other waste reduction initiatives. In Ireland, the government put a 15 cent tax on plastic shopping bags, and to everybody's amazement, the use of those bags went down by 92% in just one year. In California, last October, California became the first state in the United States to ban single-use plastic bags. Now, in America, everything happens first in California, so we expect many more states to follow. In Italy, several supermarkets allow you to refill your own bottles with shampoos, detergents, etc. But this one town, well, one uh, uh, store allows you to fill many containers. They have 60 taps, taps for detergents, taps for water, for, for honey, for milk, uh, uh, olive oil, and my favorite uh, vino. Vino Rosso, Vino Bianca. My, for me, Vino Rosso. But, and I, I go there and I get my glass. And I go to, uh, my favorite place in the whole of Italy. And back to Rossano, who, of course, is a primary school teacher. That's his job, is a primary school teacher. He's only an activist in the afternoon and the evenings and every weekend. Every weekend is going somewhere. But here are some of his children. 
and his children are getting tap water, not bottled water, and they're getting glass and ceramics and stainless steel, not plastic. So there's a place, every institution in Slovenia, you should aim to, be, have, to look like uh, Rossano's uh, primary school, as far as the materials that you're reusing. Here he is winning the Goldman Prize in 2013. Uh, he didn't sing, that's as good. Uh, and zero waste babies, zero waste. We need zero waste babies. Echo Bimbi, reusable panolini. I think you talked about that yesterday. How close are we getting to zero waste with these first 70 steps? There we are, those first seven steps. In San Francisco, big city, little space, 50% by 2000, up to 80% by 2011. And the goal for 2020 is zero waste or very, very close. Uh, in Flanders, the Flemish-speaking part of Belgium, 6 million people are up to 73% diversion from disposal. In Ljubljana, I think you're up to 63%, which is very good for a city of your size. So you become a case study which is going to influence many communities around the world are going to be copying you and inspired by you. In Italy, we have over 1,000 communities getting 70% diversion, uh, over 300 getting 80%, and several getting over 90%. And, and they're getting these diversions very, very quickly, within a year in some cases. It's a very quick solution. And going beyond 80% now, going beyond 80%, I think most people would be very happy to get to 80% diversion. But if you really want to go beyond that, then I think this step, step eight, is very, very important to do that. And this step is in two parts. Step A which is a residual separation facility, um, which have been built in Nova Scotia, in Canada. They're built in front of the landfills. Here is one in front of the landfill in Halifax. You'll notice that the road does not lead to the landfill. The road goes to the separation facility. The trucks cannot go directly to the landfill. Here's an aerial view of the separation facility. The bags come in, they're carefully opened, they go, the materials go on to long conveyor belts, paid workers pull out more recyclables, more toxic. They don't touch the dirty organic fraction that goes all the way to the end of the conveyor belt where it is shredded and the shredded material goes into long troughs. The material is turned each day and aerated and composted for 18 days. Some citizens don't think that's long enough, by the way, but at least they started this. And then this is to stabilize the dirty organic fraction above ground so it doesn't cause problems underground. And after it's been stabilized, then out it becomes landfill cover for the landfill. Now the second part of this is the Zero Waste Research Center, and the idea is the Zero Waste Research Center should study this non-recyclable fraction. And I'd like to see local universities and technical colleges, professors and students being part of this. This is the laboratory for sustainability. This is where we study our mistakes, our mistakes in industrial design. This is where community responsibility comes face to face with industrial responsibility. And the message to industry, if we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it, if we can't compost it, then industry shouldn't be making it. We need better industrial design for the 21st century. So you think most people are familiar with the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Unfortunately, that doesn't mention composting, and it should. Uh, but we need a fourth R, and the fourth R is redesign. And this allows us to put a definition of zero waste, an explanation of zero waste, on just one slide. Here it is. Uh, zero waste is a combination of community responsibility, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost, and industrial responsibility, redesign. Uh, in 2010, uh, Rossano Ercolini and Capanari started a small but important zero waste research operation. 
The first thing they did was to study what was in the residual fraction. See number two, Panolini, uh, nappies, and that's why they developed locally the reusable diapers. And another thing they kept finding in the residual fraction were these plastic coffee capsules from Lavasa and others. Thousands and thousands of these things. Uh, there they are. Look at those coffee capsules. And they wrote to Lavasa and said, look, we're, we're a zero waste community. We're up to 83%. But we keep finding your plastic capsules in our, in our residual fraction. What can we do? What can you do? And to their surprise, they got a phone call two days later from Lavasa saying, let's meet. Let's our experts meet your experts so we can discuss this. And the good news is that since that happened, there are now uh, changes. There are biodegradable coffee capsules. There are uh, recyclable coffee capsules. And they are, they are reusable coffee capsules, some from Lavasa and others from their competitors. So even a small town in Italy can influence the design of a major multinational corporation. This is very, very important. So step nine then is better industrial design. Step 10 is the backup landfill for the biologically stabilized dirty organic fraction and the currently non-recyclables. So there are all the 10 steps together. I pushed that date forward to 2030. We want, by 2030, the, the amount going to the landfill to be very small in, indeed. What I like about this is it begins with everybody. Every single human being makes waste every day. Every single human being can be involved in that step one of separation with good local political leadership. But by the time we get down to steps eight and nine, we are using the brightest minds in our society, our professors, our students, and our industrial designers. They are being challenged. That is very exciting. And it's very exciting for our money dedicated to waste management going to our universities instead of building huge machines to destroy our resources. You're putting into universities to reuse and redesign these materials. And so now, the reason it's important to get those professors and students involved in this is because we need them to link zero waste with other aspects of sustainability. Uh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable architects, sustainable energy, and so on. We need our brightest minds. The moving to a sustainable society after 300 years of moving in the opposite direction is going to require a huge effort. And the thought of doing that without mobilizing our universities is just unthinkable to me. It should be. And instead of saying we must produce a zero waste or sustainability experts, we should be saying to every university discipline, whether it's art, music, literature, economics, engineering, science, how does your subject, how does your discipline relate to sustainability? What are you going to be teaching your students so they're preparing themselves for a sustainable future? That should be every professor's mandate. Uh, so this 10-step plan is better for the economy, uh, more jobs, more social justice, uh, it's better for our health, less toxics from landfills and incinerators. It's better for our universities, more meaning, more relevance. And it's better for the planet because it's more sustainable, of course. And lastly, it's better for our children because it offers them more hope for the future. I don't know if you thought about this, but when I was 13 or 14, I was not being told every day about global warming, ozone damage, the loss of species, the loss of forests, the pollution in our own bloodstreams when we are born, when we are babies. I wasn't being told every day that there was no future for me. And the last thing that we can afford is that those children should begin their lives without hope. We've got to give them a hope. We've got to give them a vision. And we've got to give them a vision which they can relate to in simple, practical steps. It's going to be difficult. No one's going to say this is going to be easy. And then sometimes with politicians, I say, 
Zero waste is not trouble free, it's not problem free. But anywhere you go now with waste, you're going to have problems. If you, if you continue landfilling, you're going to have problems. If you try to build incinerators, you're going to have problems. If you go zero waste, you're going to have problems. But the difference is with our problems, you know you're moving your society, you're moving the planet in the right direction. Whereas those problems with landfilling and incineration, even if you overcome them, doesn't move you forward. So the art of decision making is choose the problems which take you in the right direction. And so it's better for our children, there's more hope. It's also better for the albatross. Uh, we want fewer of these and more of those. Thank you very much.